to Hebrews, and tonight we'll read in our text from chapter 8, a passage we formerly looked at, as well as in chapter 10. So if you could just kind of find both, and look at one page with one eye, and the other with the other, and we'll read them both simultaneously. So Hebrews chapter 10. Have you all learned to use both sides of your brain that way? Ever met somebody that could write two sentences at the same time with right and left hand? I'm going like this. I have a couple of times. I've always envied people that could use all of their brains. And uh, I'm pretty sure I use all of mine. There just isn't very much of it. But, uh, you know, people that have two sides can use all of it. Why are there scissors up here? Do you know what this is all about? What's that? It must be about this birthday party that we're having. I'm chicken wings after, we're, after service tonight. And I've got uh, the, the little hot dogs, but they're all beef. So, anyway, we'll have a good time. So now that I've told you that, uh, should we just go ahead and pray and dismiss? <laughs> 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 so. Oh, we are? <laughs> Did I say we're chasing chickens? <laughs> Tashi, we're in Hebrews chapter 8 and 10. We're about to read our text, and these people are... Really out of control tonight. <laughs> Look at verse 10. This is a quote of Jeremiah chapter 31. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach any man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Chapter 10. Chapter 10. You have to buy me Hershey's Kisses. It's a rule when you yawn. Chapter 10? Of Hebrews. Now we're going to chapter 10. It's your birthday, so we'll let you off. And I've already got a full thing of Hershey's Kisses. But that's the penalty for yawning, is you have to buy me Hershey's Kisses. So, to give to the children. <laughs> verse 10. Or no, chapter 10. And will you look down to verse 9 with me? Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, again a quote of Jeremiah 31, 31, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more, now a remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Father, please help us tonight with our understanding to see not only the value of the completed work of the cross and the comparison of an individual having to try to keep the law, which he can't keep, and having to offer sacrifices which are only temporary in comparison with you offering once for all a sacrifice so that we can be forever forgiven. Lord, as we see the comparison this evening, and we be challenged as those individuals to whom this was originally addressed to go forward in the faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I appreciated some of the songs that we sang today, this evening, in particular one of the songs was about consecration. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be what you want me to be. And I fear in our generation, we're kind of living in a, a period of time. And, you know, it seems as though generations are 10 to 15 to 20 years, somewhere in there. And generations seem to have tendencies. 
And I fear that we're in a time frame where commitment, dedication, and promising uh, consecration and obedience to God is just something that's just gone out of vogue. It's not, it's not in, it's not trendy right now for people to say, God, whatever it is you want with my life, I'll do it. Most people today, and it's always been a struggle. It's not that part's not new. But most people today are hesitant to say, you know what, God, whatever you want for my life, I'll go, I'll do whatever. Uh, most of the time, it's a matter of, you know what, I need to figure out. I need to take care of myself first. I need to get things figured out for me. And then figure out, you know, how my service to God fits within that. And the Holy Spirit is writing this letter to the Hebrews, to Hebrew believers, who found that serving God doesn't fit at all in their life. They found that serving God is too difficult, and they've undergone too much persecution, and overall they've made the decision or determination that they either cannot serve God or that the value in serving God isn't enough to make it worthwhile, and they've gone back in their faith. They've gone back in their faith, and a lot of it has been due to pressure. Due to pressure because of being Jewish and being under the thumb of Rome and being in a time when things are so volatile that it looks as though Rome is breathing down their necks and the destruction of Jerusalem is imminent. It's very, very difficult to be Jewish at this time. But it's exacerbated by the reality that not only is it tough to be Jewish with regard to the Roman government, but it's even more difficult because of losing your family. And, you know, sometimes when we talk about losing family, we're thinking losing hateful people with whom you didn't have a good relationship. You know, usually a lot of times we think, well, you know what, family that would kick you out for following Jesus, they're not good family at all or after all. Well, there's wisdom to that. There's truth to that. But the fact of the matter is, isn't it so that you just always love your family? Isn't it so you just love your family? It's natural to. Uh, you know, it's tragic to watch broken homes, to see mothers and fathers that are separated from one another. And I'll tell you what, uh, every child who has mom living in one home and dad living in another wants for their mom and their dad. They want to be back together. They want it. even if even if there's abuse, even if there are bad things in the in the relationship and they don't get along, the, the thing kids want is for mom and dad to be together. Because you just love your mom. You just love your mom and dad no matter what. Somebody comes to me, and, and it's happened to me on a few occasions in my life, and they say, you know what, my kids won't speak to me. When somebody comes to me and tells me their children will have nothing to do with them, I always take that with a grain of salt. Because it's very unnatural. Actually, it takes a lot to break up that natural relationship. But having said that, do you think that every person that gets saved had a bad relationship with their family before they came to Christ? Think siblings didn't like each other, didn't get along before one of them came to Christ? It isn't so at all. It wasn't the case at all. These would be individuals that were close to each other, loved each other because of the pressure. From you know, look in look at in the in the gospels. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about individuals who believed in Jesus but because of fear didn't openly confess him. Joseph of Arimathea would have been an individual like that, wouldn't he? secretly a follower of Jesus. He's the one that requested the body of Jesus at, uh, from Pilate for Jesus' burial. And yet the Bible says he followed Jesus secretly because of fear of the Jews. And so when we're talking about this relationship going back into a family that's not following Jesus, we're not talking about being separated or estranged from family members that you didn't like or you didn't get along with and now you found your true family in Jesus Christ. We're talking about people that you love dearly. It's very difficult when someone doesn't follow Jesus to be separated or estranged from them because they won't have anything more to do with you, but that was the case. So these Hebrew Christians are undergoing a lot, and truly I can understand. What they're really coming to understand is that following Jesus, following Jesus is a real commitment. And it isn't the truth of it that makes them make the decision, but it's just in some ways easier for them to go back into Judaism and to not be separated or estranged from their family members. And so many of them have made that choice. And the letter to the Hebrews is written with a tone that approaches encouraging believers who've gone back into Judaism from following Jesus and being part of the church. and encourages them from two perspectives. And what are those perspectives by way of review? What are the two ways that the author of Hebrews 
tries to persuade people not to go back from following Jesus. Tony. Well, one of them is fear. Okay, one of them is fear. There's five warning passages in Hebrews that this is what will happen to you if you go into, back into Judaism. This is what the end of Judaism is. Okay, what's the other one? That Jesus is better than everything. Okay, so it builds a case that shows that Jesus is better than anything that you could go back to. And so one of them is, is gentle and it's encouraging and it's thrilling. Uh, so far we've looked at uh, three really perspectives of why it's better to go forward in your faith. There's the comparison of the angels. The Jews had an affinity for worshiping angels. And to go back into Judaism certainly meant you would go back to knowing names of angels and even having fixtures or statues of them and, and, uh, and making a lot out of angelic beings. And we know that the Scripture compares Jesus to the angels and said, which of the angels did God say at any time, sit thou here until I make thine enemy thy footstool? And then he goes on to talk about which of them were, were called sons. And then the, the real winning argument of it, Jesus is not only better than the angels, but Jesus called us brethren. And if Jesus is higher than the angels, and He's made us His brethren, then we are also higher than the angels. And so to worship angels is to worship something that is lower than what Christ has made us to be. And that's a thrilling, encouraging argument, isn't it? You know, don't go back to worshiping angels. God's made you better than the angels yourself. You're going to worship a lower being than what God has made you to be. And then, of course, the warning is that God's judgment for angels was steadfast. He didn't give them a second chance when they rebelled against Him. What's God going to do against you when you rebel against Him? If angels were a higher form of being than you, they were a higher form of creation than you are, and God's judgment for the angels was steadfast, what will God do with you? What will be your outcome? And that's a frightening, uh, it's a frightening matter to ponder. That's the first warning passage. And then uh, he, he gives the illustration of Moses. And you know, you go back, you go back into Judaism, you're going to go back into being under the law of Moses. And he, the reminder is, what about the people that were under Moses' law that made the covenant with God and said, you know what, God will walk in your law. Here's the law. You walk in it, and they agree, we'll do what God has said. First of all, nobody's kept the law, but also remember those children that, of Israel and how wonderful they thought Moses was in his day. Because Moses was a faithful servant in all his house, but Jesus is the son in the house. So what's better, a servant in the house or the son? So you go back to Moses, you're going back to admiring a servant, and you're overlooking the son, which is better. Well, obviously the son. But then the warning was, you know what, they didn't really follow Moses anyway. What happened to the children of Israel? Did they enter into rest? Did they enter into the land of Canaan? They followed Moses, and where did they end up? They ended up with their carcasses dropping off and dying in the wilderness, and Moses didn't even enter into rest. Right. So you want to follow Jesus or you want to follow Moses, which is better? And so that's another argument or warning. Uh, the third one was that Jesus is a high priest uh, after an oath. Jesus is a high priest after an oath. And the difference would be that if you go back into Judaism, you're going to go back into a priesthood where individuals are qualified because of their heritage. They're qualified because they're Levites. But Jesus was a high priest sworn with an oath, and He was after the order of Melchizedek. And the argument there, if you'll remember, was that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek and the tribe of Levi, Levi was in his loins. So Melchizedek was a superior priest to Abraham or superior to the Levites. And so if you go back into Judaism, you're going to go back to a lesser priest than Jesus Christ. Not to mention some things that we'll see to this evening as we look at why Jesus is better than any other priest. But if you go back into Judaism, you're going to go back to a priest as well that before he offered sins for the people, first offered sin or offered sacrifice for himself and then for the people. But Jesus Christ, who having never sinned, went into the throne room of God and offered, offered sacrifice not for himself, but for us. So you go back to a high priest or to a priesthood even that needs sacrifice for sin themselves. Instead, we have Jesus Christ, a high priest, 
who needs no forgiveness for God because he's never sinned. And he offered sacrifice once for all. And last week, uh, we followed up and we looked at the comparison, or we looked at some phrases. Do you remember the phrases? I hope it was last week. My mind's a little bit blurry about when it was. But we, we looked at some of the phrases uh, beginning in chapter 8 about the law and the old covenant That's, that uh, is promised in Jeremiah 31 that God's going to give a new covenant. And we looked at some words like the word shadow or like the word pattern or like, uh, like uh, well, let's see, what was the other word? There was shadow, there was pattern, picture. picture. Was figure. picture one? Figure. figure, thank you, Charlie. That's the other word. So figure, shadow, and pattern. So what we saw was that the first covenant and the requirements of the first covenant were a pattern or a figure. We saw that the tabernacle was a pattern of the throne room of God in heaven. In other words, the holy place in the tabernacle was a pattern or was a picture or figure of what it is like in heaven. But the difference we know is the illustration of the difference between a picture and the real thing. Of course, uh, at this time you're hoping I'll get the 1990s photo of my wife out of my wallet. She said last week, she said, you know, we really need to update that photo. I said, well, you look the same. You still got the poofy 90s hair, so there's no reason not to. Okay, so this is my wife in the 1990s. <laughs> yeah, sure. Here we go. <laughs> this is my wife in the 1990s, right? Is this her? Can you all tell? You ladies can tell. You know, you can't dress up or fix your hair poofy you know, the big 90s hair or whatever. Anyway, there it is. Sorry for you that have cataracts and can't see. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's a sight for sore eyes. Uh, <laughs> this is my wife, right? And it is an accurate picture of my wife, particularly in the 1990s. But the deal is, is that this isn't enough of my wife for me. I'd be sad if I lost this photo of my wife. You know, it's surprising. This thing has been drowned quite a number of times. You know, it's, it's been, she's drowned quite a few times. And it really is in pretty fantastic shape for all the years it's been in my wallet. Honestly, I can't believe it's not laminated or anything. And somehow, I can still tell it's her in the 1990s. Your love keeps us. I'm glad it's safe. The, anyway, it's a picture. But it just doesn't do for the real thing, does it? If my wife were to say, you know what, I'm going to go away for a few months. And I'd say, not in your life. You're not going to go away for a few months, right? And she'd say, well, you have my picture. Isn't that enough? Well, let me just tell you some things that picture doesn't do. Dishes, laundry, <laughs> cooking, <laughs> wash the car, clean the house, <laughs> mow the grass, <laughs> work. Yeah, we'd be in trouble, folks. But that, that picture doesn't do it. <laughs> this is the sermon that never ends. <laughs> this is the one that never ends, right? Okay, uh, you understand? In other words, the idea of, well, we're going to go back to the tabernacle and to the Levites and to the, the offering that we don't even have today for sin, and oh, we're going to go back into Judaism because God endorsed that and so forth. My friend, you're going to go back to a picture, and just let me tell you, the picture falls short in every way that you compare it. Everything that is symbolized in the Old Testament of the Scripture, everything that symbolizes the completed work ultimately, that's Jesus Christ our High Priest, is nothing but a picture. And though a fine picture, though even an accurate picture, that's all it is. And a picture is never as good as the real thing. It's never as good as the real thing. I got it on my Google feed, some actress, I don't know what her name is, you probably know what her name would be if I, if I could remember it, but there was an article where she said that people tell her that she's prettier in person than she is uh, on the show, and they mean it as a compliment. She said, I'm thinking, well, that's a pretty nice compliment. You look nicer in person than you do on TV. And so she said that's what they say about her in person. Well, the real the deal is, is that a picture never could make Jesus look. A picture could never make Jesus be experienced in the way that he is. As great a picture as it can be, isn't it so? And my wife is much more 
beautiful in person than she ever could be in a picture. Isn't it so? Yes. Okay, so now I don't have to do dishes tonight. All right, now, because we didn't eat at home this evening, so there are no dishes. So, <laughs> let's go to our context this evening and, and move along. Hey, Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's after the order of Melchizedek. He's better than the Levitical priesthood. He is better than the Old Covenant. And the Old Covenant was promised that there would be a New Covenant given. And now I want to look at, uh, the, in particular, beginning in verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Speaking of the first covenant, he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. I want to remind you they took away the first. It is not still existing. It's not continually existing. Many people think that, well, because... You know, because God endorsed, because God was working through Israel, that if if we don't go with Jesus, then Israel was valid, and so it's still valid. Well, the Bible says He taketh away the first. He taketh away the first. Now, everything that God promised to fulfill by way of covenant through national Israel is not finally fulfilled. There are things that Jesus Christ is ultimately going to do in Christ's millennial reign with national Israel when they turn their hearts toward Him. But the fact is, is that God's not working through Israel today. And so here the Scripture is explicitly stating, go back into Judaism, you're going back into a religion that God does not endorse, He's taken it away. A lot of Christians even get caught up in this fad of Judaism. There are Christians that worship in the, quote, synagogue instead of Christ's church. And Jesus established the church. You can go back into the latter. You can say, well, you know what, this is the way it was done in the Old Testament. But friend, we're in the New Testament. See, the word testament or the word covenant, they're the same thing. This is the New Covenant. And we're in the New Covenant period that God promised. And it isn't something new. It isn't something that, you know, oh, this is a surprise. We didn't know that God was going to establish a New Covenant. Go back to Jeremiah 31 briefly with me, if you will. Jeremiah has written primarily... To, uh, to Judah, but also to Israel. And Jeremiah is written about the fact, or it's written with the message ultimately being that God is finished with you. You're going into captivity. You're going into judgment. And the consequence for it is going to be very, very serious. Uh, go back to verse 27 of Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast, and it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, so will I watch over them to build and to plant. So we're talking about a future time when God is going to build up and after, the after He's torn down or judged. In those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, this is just because of what our fathers did. We're just repeating the sins of our fathers. Verse 30, But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Now, verse 31, where we want to come to. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now I ask you, which covenant had you rather be part of? Which covenant is the better covenant? Well, certainly, by all means, the second covenant. Isn't it so? This is what's referenced, if you want to study it for your, for your own benefit, in Romans chapter 2, when the Scripture talks about the guiltiness of every person to know God and have a relationship with God because God has written His law in their hearts. And so the Gentiles have the law of God written in their hearts and Israel in the first covenant is guilty because they have God's covenant. But it's no surprise that there's a new covenant. And friend, what good is an old covenant when a new one comes along? It's, it's invalid, isn't it? 
Uh, if you were to read in other portions of the of the epistles, you would see that the that a testament is validated by what? What validates a testament? Death. The death of the testator. Good job, Mrs. Dons. The death of the testator, the person who writes a testament. But if the person doesn't die, man, I'll tell you, their their will or their last will and testament is meaningless, isn't it? <laughs> had a family member that would write people in and out. You know, you're out, you're in, you're out, you're in. You know, I, I was never in, in case you're wondering. But you're out, you're in, you're out, you're in. And it just kind of depended on how often you visited her and that sort of thing. And uh, boy, you know, if a bad day, you're out. Good day, you're in. And he's out, or she's in, or whatever. And I don't know who ended up winning that one. But <laughs> the reality of it is that you might be in, but it doesn't mean anything while the person's alive. And you know, the, the first testament, the first covenant, you know, it was good. It was good until Jesus died, and now there's a new covenant. And it's valid. And so what does that mean? It means the other one isn't valid. Friend, there are many individuals who nurse the notion that somehow God is going to one day look at how sincere or how invested you were in your system of religion, and it's going to be validated on the basis of that. But it's not. It's going to be validated on the basis of whether or not it actually is valid and whether it is what God says. And you could go back into Judaism, that's the possibility, but it's not valid. God doesn't receive it. It's not endorsed. So let's look at some truths then that show that Jesus Christ is better than, than the figure or the pattern, pattern or the shadow that we saw in chapters 8 and 9. Would you look with me down to verse 10? And we see that phrase, the words that are in italics that help us to understand the single word once. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. And the word in the original language uh, needs more words to understand because it's not a, a one time, uh, a time. It is the one time or the once for all. Once for all. And Jesus was offered for sin, a sacrifice for sin, once for all. And I don't know about you, but I get frustrated with repetition. I don't like any kind of job that you have to do again. I just don't like... I guess that's what's so discouraging about cutting grass. You know, especially in the summertime. You know, if you've got good grass and you cut it on uh, Tuesday, you need to cut it on Saturday. You know, it's just, man, you cut it and it grows back. And it keeps doing that. I used to joke uh, long before I got married, and I haven't joked about it since because I'm not allowed to. But I used to joke about someday I'm going to pour a concrete lawn and if it needs to be, it's going to be paint. And concrete is my thing. You can really spill a lot of motor oil on concrete and it absorbs it perfectly. It's just the right thing for it. But, you know, the nice thing about concrete is maintenance. You know, you spray weeds in the cracks every now and again, but it doesn't have to be maintained nearly so much as grass does. Cut the grass and what happens? A couple days later, a few days later, you need to cut it again. And I'll be honest with you, I like this whole once for all sacrifice for sin thing. Don't you? Think on this, will you please? We as believers, having been born in an era when the church has already been established and where forgiveness of sins as once for all has already been. But when Jesus Christ was offered, how much of Jesus' life was given as a substitute for our life? How much of Christ was offered? All, right? So how thoroughly have we been forgiven? Completely. How finally have we been forgiven? Completely. You realize it wasn't always that way? Because of a pattern, because bulls and goats were a picture and not the actual sacrifice for sin, every year you had to offer for your life, not just the things you've done, See, we, we're accustomed to 1 John 1 9 the whole thing. When we sin, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
And boy, that's a wonderful thing. How many times do you have to confess the same sin in this era? <laughs> well, you might be hung up on a little bit, but God isn't. You're only guilty for what you've done. And you only have to offer, ask, ask forgiveness how many times? Once. How many times do you have to be saved? Once. Now, I'm not saying that an individual could lose their salvation through not offering a yearly sacrifice. Salvation was by faith in those days, but the picture for salvation was yearly, annually. You could live, hypothetically, it's a big hypothetical, you could live a great year and not do the things you've done in the past. But you still needed to sacrifice it. You know, couldn't you say, wouldn't it be like, you know, could this be a dove year, Lord? You know, does a ram have to die this year? It's been a minor year. Yeah, every year a ram's got to die. And when Jesus Christ offered Himself, no more rams. No more anything. He's a once for all. Once for all. Once for all. I love this songs in our hymn book. Once for all, don't you? All the once for all song, psalms. Our songs, boy, I have trouble with words. All of those once for all songs have a great deal of meaning. And more so to the individual who would have been first addressed by this portion of the Scripture. Can you imagine every year the best of your goats or the best of your sheep? The best lamb on the week of the Passover, on the fourth day, pulling him out setting him aside the best of them. Every year, the best one sacrificed. And now Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb, that the, that the Ram was only a picture of has been sacrificed and it's done and it's once for all. That's a major contrast, more than we can probably wrap our little minds around because we haven't experienced from the other perspective. But think on it, will you? Think on the superiority of Jesus to the original sacrifice. And then in verse 11, we see the priest in His work. Every priest standing daily, ministering and offering, oftentimes the, what's that next word? Same. The same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Now here the Scripture is not implying that God didn't accept the sacrifices. It's saying these sacrifices couldn't take away sin. These sacrifices were shadows. These sacrifices were figures. These sacrifices were patterns. These sacrifices were pictures, and so they couldn't take away sins. This picture can't wash the dishes. It can't do the laundry. It can't mow the grass. My wife doesn't mow the grass. It can't mow the grass. It can't. But she does everything, folks. I'm telling you, you have no idea how much my wife does. And a picture will never do for me. Let me tell you, it's not the same. And in reality, the reality of it is that a priest who has to offer for his own sin... He can't, you know, every day he does the work and the work's never done. Same sacrifices have to be offered over and over and over and over again. I get tired out just thinking about it and I haven't even done it. It's uh, fatiguing and it's, it's, it's never, never finishes it. How many of y'all like to do the same job over and over again? You know, when I work on vehicles, you know what kind of parts I buy? I don't buy the one that broke. I buy the better part. You know, I figure out if a car broke, if something failed on a vehicle, then when I repair it, I figure out how I can repair it so I don't have to do the same thing again. I hate doing the same job twice. That happened to me a few weeks ago when my dad was here. I made a mistake. It didn't. Uh, I did. I left two little tiny, tiny screws out on a fuel pump, and I did the fuel pump in a few minutes the first time. The second time took me all day. I'll tell you why, because of my enthusiasm level the second time around. I don't like doing the, sec the same thing again, doing the same thing twice. And, uh, you know, the reality of it is, is that our salvation is once for all, friend. You know, some Christians today, because they can't get their theology straight about the finality of the work of the cross and their salvation, peter out, they burn out. Because over and over again they question the very thing that's a once for all thing. Again, was I really saved? And they, they go back to that place over and over and over and over again. And they just wear out. 
because they've got bad theology. Friend, Jesus died once for all, and it's finished, and it's done, and that's all that has to be done about that. It's a different matter than fellowship. And so, in verse 12, the contrast, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down. So the priest stands. Where's the chair in the temple? In the figure temple. There's no throne room. There's no throne in the temple, but there is in heaven. Why? Because God's sitting, not standing. But in the temple, show me the furniture. Where, show me the chair in the temple. And there isn't one because it symbolizes the reality that a priest is always standing, ministering. He's always going about the work because the priest work's never done. It's never finished. But Jesus, when He offered His own blood, one time, sat down, and He's still sitting. He's finished. It's finalized. It's completed. It's thrilling. It's a positively thrilling truth which cannot be stated any way other than an understatement. You, cannot, you can't shout it loud enough. You can't declare it with enough uh, descriptions or details to give it justice. It is such a great truth that Jesus is sitting and a priest is always standing. The Bible says, and again, this is, harkens back to in the beginning where Jesus is superior to the angels, from henceforth expecting till His enemies be made His footstool. And then verse 14, the final description of that, for by one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. How long? How lasting? How lasting is that once for all sacrifice with regard to its effect? Forever. Them that are sanctified. Have you ever been sanctified? Then you still are. It's a forever accomplishment. And so here, before we get to the warning next week, here we're encouraged by the thrilling truth that Jesus is a forever sacrifice. That Jesus is a high priest who is a one time and finished forever. And that our salvation is forever. And so we're also reminded that you know it too. I like the and you know it part of a statement. And that's in verse 15. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he said before. It's interesting the, the technique that the Holy Spirit uses here to convince us that this is true. Up until this point, we've quoted Psalm 95, Psalm 110, Jeremiah 31. We've looked at quotes of the Scripture, and so we've gone to the authority of the Scripture. But now we've already exhausted that. We've already seen what the Scripture teaches. And so now the technique that God's Word uses is the... Spirit in you technique. The Spirit that lives in you. Whereas the Holy Ghost witnesses this. You know, you need to learn to use this when you preach truth. You need to rely on, not only on the words and the truth. Rely on preaching the Word of God, making sure what you preach is truth. But then when, you, when you've given the truth, go ahead and go to the you know it because God's telling you so part of it. And that's precisely what this is here. How many times I've told people, you know what, I've, I've told you, I've shared the gospel with you, and you've asked questions, and we've answered questions from the Word of God, but the fact is that you know it's true because God's telling you so. And here's the inescapable part. We're reminded in chapter 6 of, that these are individuals who have once tasted the heavenly gift. They've experienced the Holy Ghost. And so now they're just being very, very gently chided or reminded I'm telling you that Jesus is a superior high priest. And you know it. Because God told you the same thing. The Holy Spirit is witnessing it. You know what's the greatest evidence? See, the, the Word of God does this at a few other occasions. One I think of is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When Paul tells the church at Corinth, For I delivered unto you all that which also I received, or the gospel which also I received, wherein you stand. Yeah, they had, let's see, unless you believed in vain. And what was it? That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried and rose again the third day 
according to the Scriptures. And then he talks about witnesses. He says, seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, and of uh, five hundred brethren, the greater part of whom are alive at this present time. But what's the real witness that Jesus died for our sin? According to the Scriptures. Yeah. So the Word of God and the witness of the Holy Spirit of God. What God does with His Word and what God does with His Spirit, my friend, is the final convincing evidence. Think on this. Evidence is helpful to show you what truth is. Certainly, things which cannot be true are difficult to believe or impossible, aren't they? There are just some things people try to convince me about. I just say, you know what, that's just impossible. That's, that's clearly a lie. That's clearly not true. But truth uh, can sometimes be clouded by possibilities for other truth. For instance, historical truth. I don't know everything that's happened in the past because I wasn't there and didn't see it with my own eyes. But I can examine the evidence, and if I'm given good evidence, I can believe it. But there's just something about things that have a ring of truth to them, isn't there? Well, you know what? Biblical truth is superior even to that. Because you can examine the evidence historically, and you can see how it could be true. But when the Holy Spirit of God grabs a hold of your heart and says, that's the truth, then you have to look inwardly to see it. Because it's inside you. And that's the argument here from the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit's a witness of this. You've experienced the Holy Ghost. God's Holy Spirit's spoken to you. And He's witnessed these things and you know it. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds will I write them. And then again we were reminded in verse 17 and 18 we finish. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Here's the conclusion. Now, where remission of these is there is no more offering for sin. Now this is an imperfect example, humanly speaking. This is not medical advice that I'm giving you right now. But uh, some now, it's been, I think, 10 years ago, my father had cancer. And uh, yeah, I, we think we know what caused it. He was cleaning out chemicals in an airplane hangar, and, and he got cancer. And uh, it was fast growing, and he had a surgery and had it removed. And after his surgery, on his follow-up checkup, they gave him, and I don't remember all the details exactly, but they had given him one radiation treatment, and they were setting him up for radiation afterward. But when he had his follow-through checkup, they said, good news is we got 100% of the cancer. There's no more cancer in your body. And he said, well, why am I going for radiation then? They said, well, to make sure you don't get cancer back. And he said, well, if I don't have cancer, what's the radiation going to do? They said, well, it could increase your chances of getting a different type of cancer by 90%. And they say, well, what if, what if I don't do radiation? Well, then you got, you know, a 10% chance of it coming back. And he decided not to do radiation. And uh, he's been cancer-free uh, for about 10 years now uh, in what we call remission. The cancer's gone. It's, it's not growing. It's not, it hasn't come back. And in spite of it, it doesn't mean he can never get cancer. It's only a medical illustration. And it's not something that, you know, it's not medical advice for you or anything like that this evening, but let me get let me just put it this way. Where remission of sins is, there is now no more offering for sin. Let's go back into a religion that kills sheep. But nothing is accomplished by it. That's about as attractive to me as going back and doing radiation when it won't do anything for me. Let's go offer a sacrifice for something that's completely washed away. That's forgiven. Let's go try to take care of a problem which no longer exists. And that's folly, isn't it? And here we are shown with a stark contrast where remission of sin these is, there remaineth no more offering for sin. This is the same argument we saw in chapter 6 when you can't be renewed again to repentance because you can't crucify Christ afresh. And the reason is because salvation is once for all. And friend, it is absolutely foolish for an individual. And get this because you're doing it when you pray over and over again begging God to save you when He's already saved you. It's the same thing. I've heard bad theology from Believers, well, they say, well, it doesn't do any harm to keep asking God to save you even if you're already saved. It does a great deal of harm, actually. It's like going and whacking a bunch of lambs for no reason. It's the same thing. That's the picture here. 
I'm going to go back into a religion that keeps offering sacrifices when Jesus was the once for all sacrifice. It's just bloody for no reason. It doesn't picture anything because the picture that's supposed to illustrate, it was only a picture and the final one was a once for all. And there's no more offering for sins. Can't do it. You cannot do it and you cannot. it doesn't have any meaning. It doesn't symbolize anything. Even now, even today, rebellious, unbelieving Jews are trying to uh, set in place the order or circumstances of events that would lead to the rebuilding of the temple, the establishing of a Levitical priesthood, and the offering of a sacrifice. Friend, I admire individuals that understand and know that God's covenants to Israel will one day be finally fulfilled in that way. But friend, men are trying to do it. And men can't do it. You can erect a temple today and God's not going to inhabit it. Because where is God living today? The Holy Spirit of God is living in us. And I don't want Him to leave and go live in a building. And He wouldn't anyway. You see it? So in every way, going back into an inferior religion is futile. It's an attempt in futility. It cannot be done. It's not possible. And next week we're going to see the dire warning of the consequences. The warning of dire consequences for individuals that attempt to do it anyway. So the argument this evening is by reason, and it's good reason, and it's, it's compelling, isn't it? Accept your once for all sacrifice. But next week we're going to get the, but if you don't, here's what's coming. The fourth warning passage in Hebrews. Father, thank you for what we've learned this evening. Please help us to be able to absorb and comprehend it. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's take a couple minutes tonight for prayer requests.